Um, so thanks again for joining. Um, again, Cameron Dennis from the Blockchain Acceleration oh, Foundation. Okay. We're a 501c3 nonprofit that starts accredited blockchain development courses at universities around the United States. We get people jobs in this space. We host these weekly events. Um, so if you're looking to connect with like-minded people or building a project looking for developers or are just interested in chatting about crypto, um, feel free to check out our membership application on our website. Um, everyone's welcome to join. We're here to accelerate blockchain education, development, and adoption. And um, I'm here with Ken Fromm from the Ethereum Enterprise Alliance. And Ken, you want to introduce yourself real quick? Enterprise Ethereum Alliance. My name is Ken Fromm. Enterprise Ethereum Alliance is a group of over 200 companies, uh, not just enterprises, but small, medium, large companies that want to advance uh, the state of the art of Ethereum in, uh, in business. And we've got working groups and we've got uh, interest groups. And it's all about doing things as part of a group that companies may not be able to do on their own in terms of specifications, EIPs, ERPCs that would benefit trade and commerce. So Ken from EEA, uh, thanks for coming. Amazing. So um, yeah, this is an event targeting uh, people working in enterprises specifically, all about zero knowledge proof applications and how it's relevant to your work. So um, I'm here, lucky to be here with Eli Jaffe and Peter Robinson, um, and Ben Fish, who is somewhere in the ether. But um, first, we're going to get started just with a brief introduction on what advanced cryptography is and what zero knowledge proofs are by Eli Jaffe. Um, Eli, you want to take a moment to introduce yourself? Yeah, absolutely. Thanks, Cameron. Uh, I'm Eli. I'm a PhD student at UCLA studying cryptography. Specifically, I specialize in uh, zero knowledge cryptocurrencies and multi party computation. Um, and yeah, I'm really excited to get to talk to you guys today. Awesome. And um, later we'll be going on uh, with Peter Robinson and Ben Fish to talk about specific use cases for um, enterprise. And then we will conclude with a networking portion where you may have seen in the beginning of this event, if you turn on your mics and cameras, you can connect directly with um, all the other people in this event. So um, Eli, you can take it away with your introduction to advanced cryptography and CKPs. Awesome, thank you, Cameron. Okay. All right, so like I said, my name is Eli Jaffe. I'm a PhD student at UCLA. I study cryptography with Rafi Ostrowski and Len Kleinrock. Uh, I specialize in cryptocurrencies, zero knowledge and multi-party computation. And I'm really excited to be here to talk to you guys about Introductory Advanced Cryptography. <laughs> OK, so let's start with the basics. Cryptography's basic question is, how can we use data without revealing it? So as a very simple example, Alice may want to send a secret message, M, to Bob. And there might be an eavesdropper, Eve, who wants to learn that message. And Alice doesn't want that. So one thing that Alice can do is she can use what's called a secret key. So a secret key in this setting is a number, K, that's known only to Alice and Bob. And what she can do with that secret key is she can encrypt her message by adding her original message, M, which we'll assume is a number, adding it to K to get her ciphertext, her encoded message. And then she can send the ciphertext over to Bob who, since he also knows K, can subtract it from the ciphertext to decrypt and get the original message. And from Eve's perspective, she only sees the ciphertext, M plus K, and without knowing K or M, she can't figure out the original message and she also can't figure out the secret key. Now, people have been doing encry encryption for a, a very long time. Uh, they've done it in some pretty funny ways. So the, one of the earliest examples of encryption was during Roman times when a Roman general was known to send a message to another Roman general by shaving one of his soldiers' heads and tattooing the message onto their head, onto their scalp, I should say, letting the hair grow back and letting the messenger run to the other general and deliver the message. Now, this is an example of so-called security by obscurity, which means that the scheme, in this case, is only secure as long as the eavesdropper, Eve, 
doesn't know what encryption method you're using because if they intercept the soldier and they shave their head, then they can learn your message just as easily as the other general was. In some sense, the key is the information of how you encrypt it. And, and this is bad because ideally your scheme should be secure even to somebody else who knows what scheme you're using. Another more modern example and somewhat more successful example of encryption was during World War II when German scientists invented this very complex uh, geared machine called the Enigma machine, uh, which had a very complicated internal state based on a sequence of keys, which were three numbers. And it was very difficult to tell what the output was from the input or even the secret key. And what actually ended up helping Alan Turing and his team of computer scientists to crack the message uh, were two things. One, the machine had a fatal flaw, which was that it would never map a letter to itself. So it did letter to letter matching, but it would never, no matter what the setting, send T to T. And that in combination with the fact that uh, Germans would begin and end their messages with the same thing, allowed Alan Turing and his team to break the code, learn the key every day, and use it to decrypt all of the messages. So although these two schemes were broken in different ways, the important takeaway here is that neither of them were ever proven secure. They were both just sort of assumed to be secure. You know, they seemed secure at the time based on what everybody was able to do, but there was no real argument. There's no proof that this is hard. And so that's really the gold standard that modern cryptography is gonna to wanna to aim for is, yes, we want to be secure, but we wanna be provably secure. So let's jump to the modern day. What does provable security look like? Well, provable security, you know, if I'm gonna prove that something is hard, the first question that come to, should come to mind is as hard as what, right? So how hard is it to break my encryption scheme? And what mathematicians and computer science have, scientists have decided is that uh, the best hard thing that we know of is math. And so let's take some of these math problems that we've been looking for efficient solutions for for the past hundred years things like the discrete logarithm factoring large almost prime numbers uh, other lesser known problems like learning with errors or the discrete diffie hellman problem uh, let's take these really hard math problems and let's say my encryption scheme is as hard as solving this math problem in other words let's design an encryption scheme such that if you're able to figure out my message from the ciphertext, you'll have actually come up with an efficient solution to the discrete logarithm problem. And so assuming that nobody trying to break my encryption scheme is also a, a, a Fields Medal winning mathematician, <laughs> presumably nobody will be able to do that. So that's provable security. and we've actually been able to do a lot more than just encryption with provable security. So here are some examples of other things that we've been able to build. We've been able to build pseudo random generators, which uh, generate randomness that looks random to any polynomially bounded observer, but in actuality is created deterministically and is only based off of a small, short random seed. We can, produce homomorphic encryptions, which are encryptions, so ciphertexts, which uh, can be added or multiplied in order to add or multiply the underlying message without ever decrypting it. So, you know, a user could send me some data, ask me to run a proprietary computation on it, and I could run that whole computation and return an encrypted output without ever seeing that user's input in the first place. We can also perform pretty efficient multi-party computations. Uh, and a multi-party computation is a situation where you have multiple parties uh, and each party has their own piece of private data and they don't trust each other. So they're not willing to share that data with each other, 
but they want to work together to compute some kind of function on the collective data. So maybe I have data on my customers and you have data on your customers and neither of us is willing to share that with each other, but we'd like to learn some information about the combined union of our customer sets. So, you know, maybe some of my customers go to your business and some of your customers go to my business and we'd rather learn more about their joint data. We can perform digital signatures. So a digital signature is just like a regular signature. You take a piece of data and you attach this little digital mark to it. And anybody who wants to can verify that it was in fact me who made that signature using some kind of public key. And importantly, nobody else, no matter how many signatures they see, can forge my signature on a new document. Now, all of these things kind of come together to build some of the larger scale cryptographic systems that you'll see today. And a great example of that is blockchains and cryptocurrencies, which is our main topic that we want to talk about today. And these are essentially public immutable ledgers, which are constructed and maintained using a combination of all of these different uh, cryptographic primitives or tools that we've discussed so far. All right, so before we move on to talk about blockchains, I'll pause for about 30 seconds and see if there are any pressing questions. So the one question that's in here is about lattice-based cryptography, and I'm gonna go ahead and push that one till the end, and I'll, I'll answer any questions that uh, aren't necessary for understanding at the end. So the difference between a multi-party computation and a multi-signature, uh, there are two very different solutions to very different problems. So a multi-signature you should think of as a digital signature uh, in the way that I just described. And the multi in that case uh, corresponds to your ability to multiply signatures together and get a uh, sort of product. So it, it's almost a homomorphic digital signature you can think. NPC on the other hand is meant for the situation I described where you have multiple parties and they have different pieces of data and they want to compute some function on that data. All right. So what is a blockchain? Like I mentioned before, functionally speaking, it's a public decentralized append only ledger. So all of the data is freely available. That means it's public. It's decentralized, which means that that data is not held by a single person or a, a small group of people. It's in fact maintained by everybody simultaneously on the network. And it is immutable or append only, which means there's no delete operation. Once data is on the blockchain, it remains there. And this is kind of how we like to visualize blockchains. You've got some data arranged into a block, you know, a sequence of transactions, whatever. And you have some kind of stamp, some sort of usually proof of work, but there's lots of other ways to uh, approve that a block is valid. So some kind of proof that it's valid. And then some kind of link to the previous block, which here looks like a hash value. Now, that's basically all we're gonna talk about in terms of what a blockchain is. We're not gonna dig too much into how they work or the specifics, uh, because honestly, it, it differs a lot between various blockchains. We're just gonna treat it as it is, a public decentralized append-only ledger, and we're gonna talk more about how do we use blockchains. So why do we care about blockchains? Why is it desirable to have a public decentralized ledger? Well, let's start with the word decentralized. Right now, we already have ledgers. It's just that we have centralized ledgers. So these are you know, ledgers of transactions held by banks or any other kind of financial firm or even non-financial businesses like real estate firms. Uh, all of them basically maintain ledgers of transactions with their customers. And the problem is that maintaining those ledgers in a centralized place with one person or one computer leaves them vulnerable to attack from the outside or abuse from the inside. So in the terms of abuse, or I guess this is attack, we know that uh, hacking and identity theft is a multi-million dollar industry, if not billion dollar industry at this point. Um, 
people's data is constantly being stored in a single place and that leaves it extremely vulnerable to being stolen. Not only that, it can simply be sold by the person who holds the ledger in a lot of situations. You know, this, this recently came up in the news how Robinhood, who keeps track of all of their users' data, and that's how they make their money is by selling their users' transaction data to big banks. They finally got outed as who they are. And so there's plenty of companies whose business models are essentially central on centralized on buying and selling their users' data. And this is much more commonplace than anybody even thinks. Not only that, you know, your, your data can be sold, it can be stolen, but it can also just be changed at will. And, and you, you don't really have any control of that. Um, banking errors happen every year and they cost people a lot of money. And most people without the means don't know it's happening or don't have any way to fight it. So with our motivation for decentralizing uh, ledgers in mind, let's try to think about how we should actually use a blockchain, because it's not a one size fits all solution. So the main uh, qualifying factor you should think about when deciding, do I need a blockchain for this situation is, is your data final? Is it permanent? Because any data that needs to be edited and you don't want to have the original form uh, on the blockchain, that's not an ideal use case. So some of the things that have been used and in my opinion do belong on a blockchain, financial transaction records, you know, uh, personal identification information, your credentials, any kind of public contract, so you might hear smart contract a lot, uh, any kind of history, like medical history or employment history that might need to be accessible publicly. Or you could even think about performing uh, democratic processes on the blockchain. So voting for elected officials or voting for specific policies. Now there's a key problem that I've been sort of intentionally avoiding, which is the problem of privacy. So everything that I mentioned on the previous slide, you know, using a blockchain for finance or for medicine or for voting, these all require some form of privacy. I mean, you're, you can't store your financial records on a public blockchain. You can't store your medical history or your, your votes on a public blockchain because these, these are inherently private matters. The tricky part is that we don't need full privacy either. If, if the data was fully private, then it wouldn't be useful. Uh, we, we sort of need to selectively reveal some traits about the data without revealing all of the data in itself. So for example, you know, if, if we're storing financial transactions on the blockchain, we need to be able to audit them or certain people need to be able to audit them to make sure that, you know, your balance sheet is solvent or that you didn't overflow your bank balance. Similarly, if, if you have, if you're storing medical history on a blockchain, you know, your, your doctor should be able to view your medical history or in some cases, other professionals who are granted access by your doctor. And, you know, in, in the case of voting, we need to know the results of the election, but we might not want to know who votes for who, or even in certain cases, we might not, not want to vote, know the vote count because if you reveal the vote count, then that could influence people's opinions on what they're gonna vote in the next election. You know, if it's a total landslide, I might think that, my vote won't count if I vote for the same candidate the next time. And this is something that people who study voting theory have thought a lot about. <laughs> okay, so this is our question. How are we supposed to get confidentiality and auditability at the same time? You know, this if we want privacy, we want to also use the data. So how can we get both? Now, normally without a blockchain, we would just trust somebody, you know, trust some central authority to store the data, keep it confidential, and to selectively reveal it when necessary to whoever is authorized and whoever needs to see it. But we've already gone over a bunch of reasons why this is bad. Uh, centralization allows for attack, abuse, mismanagement, etc. And now we've introduced another problem, which is that even the person verifying the data is uh, centralized. You know, you've got some third-party audit auditor like the IRS 
that can come in and make sure the data is correct. But what happens if you know the third party auditor becomes corrupted? Then you've got a real problem. So ideally, you know, we we not only don't want to centralize the authority managing the data, but we'd like to distribute the power of auditing the data as well. Now, a private blockchain is a nice buzzword, but unfortunately, uh, buzzwords in the crypto space are often not very descriptive, and it unfortunately does not solve our problem. So a private blockchain is just a blockchain where the set of users is limited. You know, they register beforehand. We know who they are. Uh, you can't make multiple accounts. You, you can't uh, cheat and trick somebody into thinking you're somebody else. For every account, there's one person tied to that account. But once you're on the blockchain, there's no guarantee of privacy between those users. So user one and user two, you know, I'm still going to see your data and you're still going to see mine. So how can we get privacy and auditability in a public decentralized system without trusting some centralized party? This is essentially the question we want to answer. And that takes us to the last part of our presentation. So I'm going to talk about zero knowledge proofs. But before I jump to that, I'm going to pause. Once. All right, we've got a lot of zero knowledge proof questions. So I might, I'm probably going to save these questions on zero knowledge proofs until after I do the zero knowledge proof section. Uh, but really quickly, we've got yeah, all of these questions I'm going to save until after this section, but these are all very good questions. Hopefully, the next section will clear up some of them. All right, so what is a zero-knowledge proof? A zero-knowledge proof is a protocol between a prover and a verifier in which the prover wants to convince the verifier that a particular statement is true, a statement that's known to both of them without revealing anything else to the verifier. So that's why it's called a zero knowledge proof. It's because other than the fact that statement X is true, there's zero knowledge gained by the verifier during the protocol. Now, it's not necessarily gonna look like a proof in the classical sense because a proof as we understand it is written, it's finite, you know, you read it and you're done, but this is a protocol, so you might have multiple rounds of interaction between P and V, where P convinces V over multiple rounds that the statement is true. And so in that sense, it might look a little bit more like an argument between the players. And some people will use the word argument versus proof. There's slight technical differences, but both of these refer to protocols. So here's an example. Peggy wants to convince Victor that this transaction X doesn't cause her balance to go below zero. And using a zero knowledge proof, she can prove this without revealing anything about the transaction, you know, the amount, her current balance in her account, or any of her other private information. And the simplest zero knowledge proofs look like a sort of challenge response game. So the verifier gives a series of challenges and the prover gives a response. And if the prover successfully responds with what the verifier is looking for, you know, after multiple rounds of repeating, then the verifier is convinced that either the person truly did not exceed their current uh, account balance, or they somehow got very, very lucky on all of these different challenges. And if you do enough challenges, then the probability of getting lucky is small enough that you can ignore it, which is what every cryptographer loves. Okay, so that's the basics. A zero knowledge proof is an interactive protocol for proving a, that a common statement is true. So what is a non-interactive zero knowledge proof? This is where we're gonna get into some of the different types of zero knowledge proofs, different flavors as they say, and talk about why they might be useful for blockchains. So like I said, most zero knowledge proofs are interactive protocols where Peggy and Victor talk back and forth. But a really amazing discovery was that some of these can actually be made non-interactive into non-interactive zero knowledge proofs or NISICs as they're called. So a non-interactive proof is more like the classical proof that I was talking about before where the prover posts a single proof, you know, a single written proof. And that same proof can be 
publicly verified by any verifier who wants. And so this is very different from what we were talking about before because with an interactive zero knowledge proof, if I wanted to convince multiple verifiers that my statement was true, I would have to engage in the protocol with each of them individually. But in this case, if I construct a non-interactive zero knowledge proof and I have some public place where I can post it, then I can just post my proof and anybody who wants to verify it can verify it without me having to engage with them at all. Now the actual method, if anybody is curious for making these non-interactive zero knowledge proofs is called the Fiat Shamir heuristic. And it's pretty simple. It replaces the random challenges with uh, sort of random challenges that are instead generated by a hash function. And so that lets the prover kind of generate the challenges themselves in a way that supposedly doesn't allow them to cheat. Uh, there's a lot of controversy about this heuristic and you know what, what its proof basis is, but most people tend to trust it. So if you're interested, look up the Fiat Shamir heuristic. So here's a visual example of what I just said. Uh, Peggy, can, instead of interacting with Victor, Vinny, and Vicky individually, she just constructs her whole proof on her own, and she posts her statement and her proof to this public place, and everybody can individually come to the conclusion that the proof is true. So finally, we can get to how these are used in blockchains. And it sh should be sort of intuitive by now, but let's spell it all out. So the solution, if we want to make our blockchain both confidential and auditable, is not to store our data itself on the blockchain. But instead, we're going to post a, a sort of commitment to the data, something that doesn't reveal the data, but binds us to that particular data. And this is well known in cryptography. And along with that commitment, we're going to post a non-interactive zero-knowledge proof. So the non-interactive zero-knowledge proof is uh, going to prove that the data is well-formed, it belongs on the blockchain, and it's also going to prove any properties of the data that might be necessary. So for example, if I'm posting a transaction to the Bitcoin blockchain, I need to prove that it doesn't exceed my current balance. So instead of posting the actual details of the transaction, I will post a commitment to that transaction, and I'll post a proof, a non-interactive zero knowledge proof, that my data, uh, my transaction that leads to that commitment is valid, it's an actual transaction, and it doesn't exceed my account balance. And then anybody who wants to verify that my transaction was valid can just verify the zero knowledge proof. And even more than that, if later on you need to know more about my transaction, you know, suppose you're the IRS, then you can simply request more zero knowledge proofs and I can post more proofs referring to that same commitment, or we can just uh, perform an interactive zero knowledge proof between the two of us. And so here's a visualization of what we just said. This is essentially the same picture as before, except the public place that we're posting it to is a proposed block in the blockchain. So Peggy makes her transaction. She posts her commitment to that transaction, which is this H of X. And she posts a proof that says she knows a transaction which is valid and which produces this commitment. And so anybody who wants to verify it can just plug in, in this proof into their zero knowledge proof verifier. And they can know for a fact that the X that produces this commitment is a valid transaction. So just to recap, we know what zero knowledge proofs are, we know about interactive versus non-interactive zero knowledge proofs, and we know how we can use them to get a secure and auditable blockchain. And so we can use that secure and auditable blockchain to do lots of different things. We can verify the validity of sensitive information like votes, locations, medical history, uh, we can even do more interesting things like verifying that computation is done correctly when it's done on private data. Uh, or we can even, you know, there's examples of games that are being played over the public blockchain. So I don't know if anybody here has heard of uh, Dark Forest, but it's an Ethereum-based blockchain game where you're trying to deduce the locations of other players in the game 
And so you post your move to the blockchain, but it's really important that you don't actually post your move to the blockchain because that would reveal your strategy to all the other players. And instead, you just post your commitment to your move and as your knowledge proof that it's a valid move. And so I, as you might be able to tell, uh, these are pretty creative solutions. And, and some of the best applications of zero knowledge proofs actually come from non-cryptographers who learn about this and become excited about it and figure out uses for the technology in their own fields and end up taking it into their own hands. So I and we are really excited to see, you know, what's going to happen in this space and what people like you in uh, enterprise can think of to do with zero knowledge proofs. So that's the end of my presentation. Thank you guys so much for having me. And uh, yeah, I'll, I'll pass things back to our lovely hosts. Eli, if you wouldn't mind, there's a couple questions in the chat that would be wonderful if you can uh, just take a quick peek at it. Yeah, so let's go with the questions. So starting from the top, are zero knowledge proofs efficient? Uh, this is a great question. Short answer, yes. Long answer, uh, it depends what you want. Um, you can pretty much find a zero knowledge proof that's going to be efficient enough for your specific circumstance. Uh, but some of the really amazing uh, advances in cryptography and in zero knowledge proofs recently mean that we've been able to get actually extraordinarily efficient zero knowledge proofs. Um, a lot of them are based off of this probabilistically checkable proof paradigm where verifying the zero knowledge proof actually doesn't require you to read the whole thing, which is pretty amazing. You can just flip some random coins and poke the proof in a couple places and based off of some fancy math, you know that uh, if these couple small tests pass, then with overwhelming probability, the whole proof is correct. So th this is the efficiency that most people tend to care about is the verifier efficiency, uh, because the verifier is usually much more computationally bounded than the prover. Uh, the verifier is usually the person submitting the data. So it's, it's you know, or sorry, the verifier is the person uh, who is verifying the proof and receiving the data. And so a lot of times this is uh, a user, this is a client. And so we really care about restricting the verifier efficiency, but actually they've gotten so efficient in terms of the verifier that now people are really hammering down on the prover efficiency because we've kind of gotten it as, as far as we can go on verifier efficiency. So they're getting really efficient. Uh, you can do things like batched verification where I can get a thousand zero knowledge proofs and I can verify them all in one go uh, in whatever cost it would take to verify a single one. And so, yeah, with all these advancements, they're, they're more efficient than ever. The next top question from David Gordon, uh, does zero knowledge help compliance? Yes, a lot. And, and this is one of the main uh, applications for zero knowledge proofs in the sort of decentralized finance space. So this is getting really popular. Uh, decentralized finance companies are having to submit more to compliance regulations like you know your customer regulations uh, and so with zero knowledge proofs you can actually prove your compliance under these different you know circumstances without revealing anything else other than the fact that you're compliant so this is one of the golden golden egg use cases of zero knowledge proofs great question all right stepping away from zero knowledge proofs a little bit this is from jack gilcrest uh, is quantum slash Grover's algorithm a threat to networks secured with SHA-3 on a 10 plus year time frame? So Grover's algorithm, if I remember, it finds like the input, it solves like the input output problem. So this is like, you know, you have the output to a hash function and you want to find the input, which is you know, assumed to be hard. Uh, this is stretching my expertise a little bit. I'm not, I'm not a quantum programmer, but based on my understanding of the science, uh, algorithms like this to be run reliably require more qubits than we're even close to capable of constructing right now. I think we're at something like a, a 980, maybe 90 qubit quantum computer. And this is just not enough to reliably run an algorithm like this. And what I will say is that 
cryptographers have been studying uh, post-quantum cryptography for a while now. And for most of these uh, networks that are secured with SHA-3, we have a backup quantum secure system ready to be deployed as soon as somebody uh, comes up with a quantum computer large enough. So the goal is to always have post-quantum cryptography outpacing the rate of quantum computer progress, and I'm, I'm confident that uh, we'll do that. I don't think the 10 the 10 year time frame is close. I think it'll, it'll be more like 20 or 25. Uh, we have a question from Robert Lefke. What is unique about lattice-based cryptography? Uh, awesome question. So when people say lattice-based cryptography, what they're referring to is the underlying hard math problem that I talked about. So we, we can base our cryptography on lots of different kinds of hard math problems. And the lattice that they're talking about is essentially like, you know, the grid of integers, you can think of it. So Z2 with integers. Uh, and so think of them as, as combinatorial math problems. You know, these, these are like problems uh, based on uh, the combinatorial nature of this lattice and how hard it is to sort of navigate through it. And in terms of what's unique about it, uh, it's really just a unique sort of set of problems to start with. So what you can prove in cryptography is extremely dependent on what assumptions you start with. And so a lot of cryptographers really, you know, there's been a lot of work already studying these lattice-based assumptions. And because it's, you know, combinatorics is one of the easier spaces, I think, for the human mind to wrap itself around in terms of advanced mathematics, I think a lot of people find comfort here and they, they find it easier to prove things and to build things out of these lattice-based assumptions. Our next question uh, says, why are there so many different types of zero-knowledge proofs? So the reason that there are so many different types of zero-knowledge proofs is because there's so many different ways that a zero-knowledge proof can be efficient or that we can evaluate it. So like I said, you might care about the verifier efficiency the most, how hard the verifier has to work. You might care about how hard the prover has to work. You might care about uh, how much uh, how big the messages are, so how big the actual proof is, or how big the messages are that you send back and forth in the proof. You might care about how many rounds it takes to verify the zero knowledge proof. You know, is it non interactive, which would be one round, or is it five or six or seven rounds of interaction? Or do you really care about, you know, the prover's storage space? How many, maybe your prover has really limited storage space and you need to be able to prove it without storing a lot of memory. So there, there's all these different dimensions that you could care about. And so what cryptographers do is we're always looking for the best solution in one particular area. And so you can have the best zero knowledge proof for verifier efficiency or the best zero knowledge proof for prover efficiency. Uh, and that's basically resulted into all the different zero knowledge proofs. I mean, that in combination with there are different ways to construct zero knowledge proofs. So, you know, this, this is the most efficient, uh, most verifier efficient zero knowledge proof from LWE. And this is the most prover uh, efficient zero knowledge proof from some other assumption. So <laughs> the, that's basically what you're going to see when you look at a different zero knowledge proof. Nowadays, people have kind of stretched the individual uh, metrics as far as they can go. And we're more so trying to find the sort of Goldilocks solution, you know, the zero knowledge proof that's the best prover efficient, efficiency and the best verifier efficiency and the best communication complexity. Uh, and so hopefully, you know, maybe one day soon, we'll be able to just ignore most of the zero knowledge proofs as irrelevant and just use the good zero knowledge proof. Uh, we've got a lot more questions, but Cameron, I think we're running out of time. So I don't want to go on too long. No, nope, uh, we are just getting to the moment where we will be transitioning to the fireside chat. But thank you so much, Eli. That was a really awesome explanation of all the stuff. So hello, I'm Peter Robinson. I am a technical director and applied cryptographer from Consensus and I'm currently actually working on Filecoin retrieval markets and atomic cross-chain transactions. Um, and so with me today, we've got Ben Fish. And Ben is a PhD student who's at Stanford working in the cryptographic um, research center with Dan Bonnet. He's working That's on- right. 
yeah, you're working on verifiable computation, verifiable storage, verifiable fairness, where verifiable computation is all about something happens off chain and you can verify somehow rather that it really has happened and the output is correct. So the computation happened correctly. Verifiable storage, which is all about um, making sure that data really is stored properly. Verifiable fairness, which is around verifiable random number generation. And in particular, is working on, and importantly for today, is working on verifiable um, intersection of verifiability and privacy, which is where um, zero knowledge proofs comes in. So hopefully I haven't mangled your um, history. <laughs> Not at all. <laughs> um, so how, how are you today, Ben? Doing well, yeah, here in my uh, house in San Francisco. How are you doing? I'm, I'm doing pretty yeah. good. So, so do you have a fire going? Do I have a fire going? Yeah. Uh, oh, fire side chat. <laughs> fire. Uh, you know, I have a, I have a fireplace, but it doesn't, it doesn't actually have a, a chimney. So that's the problem. Oh, that could be really <laughs> dangerous. You could get. <laughs> so, um, so we we're, we're here today to talk about zero knowledge proofs and business, and you know, I mean, we we've heard, um, Ellie, Ellie talk about you know what what they are you know and um and so i think people have got a bit of an idea what what they are now and so now it's a matter of well what of these things you know so you've got something's happened and you can prove that it happened but so how would you you know what use cases can you see or can you talk us through that you know you could use for that technology yeah, well, actually, I think that Eli uh, gave some pretty good um, overview of some use cases as well through his presentation. I thought that that was really nice. Um, it really gave a sense of at the same time of how they how they work, at least at a high level. Also, what they can be used for, um, specifically for privacy on blockchains. Um, so that is one of the use cases, right? I mean, uh, Eli explained. Um, what is the value of having public decentralized ledgers as a means of uh, having a shared consistent um, view of information across a network of participants. But this need to balance um, privacy and auditability and, and zero knowledge proofs is exactly the, the technology that's needed for that. Um, the way that I like to think about it is that you have this uh, decoupling between using the blockchain to enforce a cons consistency, right? To enforce that everyone has a copy of the same information and can verify that, and that everyone uh, is uh, subject to certain rules for how they can um, modify or add on to this information. But the enforcement of that consistency and those rules doesn't need to actually involve the underlying data itself. So um, if a subset of the participants um, has some of that data, uh, they can prove that that data is being updated uh, 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 according to the rules, right? And that uh, um, without actually posting that data in the clear to the public ledger. And zero knowledge proofs are exactly used for that. It's used for, uh, because the, the blockchain is not, doesn't need to perform computation on data, it just needs to verify computation that happens could, somewhere else. Could, could an example be then you've, you've got, say, a state machine where you've got, I don't know, um, at warehouse in transit delivered. And so though you've got those three states and say maybe multiple parties have that and you can, tra you can transit from one state to another to another and the parties can see what's going on, and it's very, you've got this verifiable event on the blockchain, but the uh, observers who are looking at the blockchain can't see anything because they can't understand it. Is that what? Is that an example, or is that just a little bit too abstract? Uh, so I think that's a basic example where uh, you have a set of parties who want to have a um, kind of enforced c consistency of the information that they have, and that can actually be achieved uh, even just using uh, like Merkle proofs, where uh, and 
yeah, Merkle tree proofs, where you don't actually fully need zero knowledge proofs. You need something called uh, authenticated data structures, um, which allow you to basically, uh, you know, verify that you're all looking at the same information, um, but you're comparing it against some uh, hash value that's actually stored publicly and not the not the data itself. Um, but where zero knowledge proofs uh, come in uh, to really help is when you want to enforce some kind of rules on how this data can be updated. So you want uh, either a public uh, decentralized network or even just a single server to be able to enforce those rules without actually seeing the underlying data. And so the perfect example of that are, are uh, how financial transactions have been implemented um, on blockchains. And, and so uh, private uh, transactions uh, achieve privacy by proving to the to the ledger that money is being moved from one party to another, okay, but without revealing um, who that money is being moved uh, between or how much is being moved. The, uh, the, the operators of the blockchain can just verify as your knowledge proof that this transition of ownership of this money is happening. And that can be used for any transactional system, right? Any transactional system that for example, maintains a records of records of ownership. So you could have, it doesn't need to be money. It could be any kind of asset, um, real estate titles, uh, could be ticketing and reservation systems. We have so many examples of, um, well, I, I guess business, uh, what, what in the, uh, in the cloud computing business, they call online transaction processing systems, uh, financial networks being one example where the, uh, the, the operators of the transactional system do not actually need to uh, know the contents of transactions if zero knowledge proofs are used. Uh, and so actually I, I, I like to point this out that uh, the way that blockchains use zero knowledge proofs to achieve privacy can be valuable for data security in the whole industry of cloud computing. And it doesn't just need to be um, where businesses want to use blockchains and the, uh, and use zero knowledge proofs in order to achieve privacy on blockchains. It can actually be used to to achieve um, a better uh, a form of cloud security, where the cloud can operate a transaction processing system without actually receiving any client data, and it just verifies zero knowledge proofs. That make, makes sense to me. And uh, I'm hoping that all the people who are listening in um, also understand that whole, the whole idea of uh, executing stuff and then um, off chain and or in the cloud and then just verifying that it's happened. Um, and so um, what about in production or in the real world? Have you seen, um, have you seen actual implementations at the moment and and how or is it have you seen po i guess let's work, let's start at pocs have you seen pocs and what pocs have you actually seen and and how, how did those pocs go and yeah can you tell us about that uh, yes yeah, so i actually i don't know too much um about I, it's my general sense that uh, although the te the technology has matured quite well, you know, over the last ten years, it's only really started to be integrated into industry. And so you do have uh, a number of different POCs where enterprises are looking at using um, blockchains and are and are specifically looking at how they can get private transactions on blockchains in the same way that um, uh, projects like Zcash have for payments. Uh, and one ex good example of that would be uh, JP Morgan's pilot with Quorum, where they were using uh, zero knowledge proofs in order to achieve private transactions on their blockchain. Um, I'm aware of the uh, baseline uh, protocol initiative, although I don't know. I mean, there they also have a similar thing going where um, a theor somebody can s s set up a workflow and initiate it on in an Ethereum smart contract, and then the Ethereum smart contract can verify um, that the database is up the, the the database is updated according to specific rules without actually seeing the contents of the database. Uh, I don't know, however, how mature that is in terms of real world adoption. You see a lot of 
projects building things, um, but I haven't seen so many uh, real examples where it's being used to say run a business. I mean, um, I think it would be fabulous if uh, businesses in, in in the cloud computing industry would start using zero knowledge proofs. Uh, they don't really need to move to, to using blockchains, but even just using zero knowledge proofs so that they don't need to actually receive raw data when they're processing transactions, right? They're, the banks are moving. There's There's been a huge trend of banks moving to the cloud for uh, bank transaction processing. And there are, as Eli was mentioning, right? There can be severe consequences of having all this data stored in one place, um, creates a honeypot for, for hackers to uh, obtain private uh, information about customers. And so if uh, cloud servers are just verifying zero knowledge proofs of transaction correctness, instead of storing that and receiving that data um, in the clear, that would uh, be a huge win for data security. That, that would be massive. Um, and as you say, you wouldn't have that massive honeypot um, as well. Um, yeah, well, and, and another um, use case that I remember hearing about and it was publicised, though it's now a few years back, was the um, banking in um, Sing Singapore. They were trying to do um, bank interbank reconciliation. So rather than having just a central bank um, reconciling between all the partner banks, the idea was you didn't have to have it doing the interbank reconciliation, and that was all using zero knowledge proof. So I'm not sure if that ever went into production. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, 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 yeah. Uh, so, oh, sorry, go ahead. Oh no, no, finish what you're yeah, going to say. Yeah, I was going to say. Yeah, I, I too have seen baseline, and I know there are hundreds of um, groups um, in organisations involved in it. Um, and I know there are lots and lots of um, POCs happening, but I'm not sure about how, how close they are to production. But I'd say as far as going into production, it's the most likely be, um, one, um, simply because there are so many different organisations trying to make it happen. Um, but yeah, that's... Right. You also have a, a similar uh, systems in in the public blockchain sphere, right? You have a a, a lot of new uh, public decentralized blockchains popping up that do have the capability of setting up an arbitrary, um, you know, zero knowledge uh, an arbitrary workflow that goes through zero knowledge proofs. So mm -hmm. in the in the language of of blockchain, that means that you can set up a smart contract, right, which uh, has some state and users send transactions to the smart contract, and that changes the state of the smart contract over time. Mm -hmm. um, but the smart contract is just, um, the only thing that's stored publicly is some verification key for a zero knowledge proof. And so uh, the operators of the blockchain can enforce, are verifying that transactions are, are updating the state of the smart contract according to the rules. And only those who are actually uh, the authorized participants in this smart contract can actually actually know or hold the real data in the smart contract. And there are a number of, uh, of systems that are trying to build this, uh, many different projects in the, in, the, in the public blockchain realm. Um, I'm just not sure what enterprise businesses will look to adopt because using a public blockchain is, um, is a big transition for a business. So you might see baseline. Well, I think baseline is running on Ethereum too. So I, uh, I'm not sure about that as well. Um, I, I would imagine that, that businesses would first, uh, just, you know, in, instead of moving to, to the public blockchain realm would just try to have a single server run, um, run a database mm -hmm. and use their knowledge proof for privacy in order to in, in, enforce privacy, um, as well as consistency among a shared group of businesses mm -hmm. um, without actually moving first to the public blockchain realm. That's what I would expect to see. Yeah. Or could they use a um, enterprise, like a permission blockchain between the parties and using zero knowledge proofs on top of that so that maybe the, the, the blockchain is between the greater consortium, but then when I want to do a channel, say, or, you know, like a little um, piece, say, just between, say, you and me, 
but not with every the other 70 people who are on this call, then could we have like a side chain off that main consortium chain? Would, would that make sense? Well, absolutely. Really, the term blockchain these days is, um, is, is used broadly nowadays to mean any kind of shared database. I don't know if everyone agrees with the, with the usage of blockchain for that, um, you know, to, to encapsulate that, but whatever blockchain means to different people, um, there, you see businesses these days setting up shared uh, authenticated you know, databases that are shared among a group of participants and zero knowledge proofs are, are an excellent technology to use in order to enforce that, um, you know, consistency of shared information um, and in order to enforce certain rules of how the data can be updated among these different participants, but without re um, revealing the information to, to everyone that's participating. Yeah. Uh, and, and yeah, um, I was going to ask you, Peter, because I know that you were at RSA security for a really long time mm. um, and kind of saw the uh, industry adoption of something that started as, as quite academic and then suddenly became mainstream. So I wonder if you have some perspective on whether we'll see that for a, a, a new and advanced type of uh, uh, security technology like zero knowledge proofs. Yeah. Well, zero knowledge proofs are quite old actually, but they've, they've matured to the state of becoming practical and now uh, and now I'm wondering, you know, what, what will the roadmap look like for seeing businesses um, really adopt this widely? Yeah, and, and so thank you for that. So that, and I think that uh, it, it is a worthy question and thing to think through is the evolution of technology. And so if you can think that, you know, we saw um, the Enigma machines from the 1940s and then we had the symmetric cipher algorithm, say, as DES in the um, 1970s. And in fact, our SNA, so Rivesh Shamir Adelman, came up with and patented the RSA algorithm in 1977. And around about the same time, you had Diffie and Hellman also um, have come up with their um, key agreement scheme. And so those schemes, when they were first envisaged, like zero knowledge proofs were just not even wildly computationally doable. You know, I mean, at the moment where you um, have say 2048, 3072 bit RSA keys, and there was just no way that you could possibly run that in a you know reasonable time frame back in the 70s. It was just not possible. The CPU power was just not there. Um, and in fact, RSA had a patent on that and that's actually the company rode off that patent for quite a long time but then the thing that really drove industry and everyone into security and into encryption and into um, you know signing data and really trying to keep their data secure was standardization and so there was the um, FIPS 140 standard which is um, from the Department of Commerce in the USA, so from NIST. And it's all around, you will essentially have good crypto that works. I mean, that's what it really comes down to. But then also you had the payment card companies like MasterCard and Visa Card, and they got sick of um, silly things happening like people storing a million credit card numbers in the plain text and then people stealing them. Um, right. You know, and so they then standardized. And so PCI compliance is probably the thing that forced industry across the world, but in particular in the USA, to actually modernize and have good security. So I think mm -hmm. for our, what we're talking about, zero knowledge proofs, that's going to be the driver is when company when, when the government says look if you want to interact with the us government and supply us with data that's in the cloud we want to make sure that computation in the cloud's actually provable and so if they were to come up and standardize that that will definitely um, be a forcing function for let's standardize it and get it sorted out and so you would have nist would probably come up with a nist standard for zero knowledge proofs and um, also say how they fit it into a larger system as well. Um, yeah, who knows? Maybe yeah, that makes sense. Right. I think the I think the regulation would be uh, specifically around saying if you're running a business in the cloud, 
that needs to process transactions, mm -hmm. it actually gets a lot more more, uh, more difficult when they when the cloud uh, service needs to perform a computation. So let's get to that next. But for any business out there that's running some kind of transaction processing, like payment processing, um, ticketing, reservation, um, et cetera, then the regulation could say, you know, you don't actually need to be receiving this data in the clear. There are clear rules that you're verifying that transactions conform to that can be verified using a zero knowledge proof. You don't need to actually receive that data in the clear. Um, and because zero knowledge proofs have, have uh, matured to the extent that they're actually quite practical to use these days, uh, it would be really interesting if we would see some some regulations on uh, data security for uh, for cloud computing mm -hmm. in that regard. When it comes to so cloud computing is kind of uh, broken up into um, transaction processing mm -hmm. and um, analytical processing, or at least that that's one dichotomy. And uh, analytical processing is where the the business service is actually performing some computation and needs to derive some results and then give that back to its clients, right? Any anytime where uh, clients are supplying data and then um, uh, the business in the cloud is doing some uh, machine learning on that data or other kind of uh, statistical analysis, computing some result and giving it back to the clients, that can't be done using zero knowledge proofs. That requires uh, computing over encrypted data if you uh, want to keep data out of the cloud. And that requires something that's much more expensive called uh, fully homomorphic encryption. Mm -hmm. um, it would be really, uh, I mean, that's also a maturing technology in cryptography. It is not yet nearly as practical as zero knowledge proofs, but maybe one day we'll be able to do both kinds of cloud computing without actually giving the cloud any data. And that would be really cool. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. So, so with, even with homomorphic encryption, if you only want to do certain sort of operations, it's reasonably efficient. It depends exactly. That's what, correct. You know. Yeah. Arbitrary computations over encrypted data are still uh, very expensive, uh, much more expensive than um, zero knowledge proofs, which are not f used for computation. They're used for, for, for proving that a computation's result is correct. Mm. Um, but, you know, one day we may see that technology as well mature to the state that all of cloud computing could be done over entirely uh, encrypted or hidden data. Yeah, that'd be awesome. Absolutely yeah. awesome. Um, yes, we, we, we would have finally gone from having cloud computing in the 2000s to actually having cloud computing that we're actually happy with by say 2040, we're all good. Yeah, I think, I mean, that would be really the holy grail of data security in the cloud where the cloud doesn't actually have any data to leak. Yeah. So one of the things I know, I know we, we, so, you and I have had a you know chat about possible things to talk about. Now I'm going to go off script. So hopefully you're not going to go, ah, no, now what do I, I haven't thought about this. Yet. <laughs> <laughs> but um, so people have been talking about, um, uh, about quantum, you know, and will the quantum computers break everything? And, you know, uh -huh. so, so, I mean, I know a lot of, say, the ZK snarks, they're based on ECC and we've got a hash there. So you've got a message digest function as well. So are there, I mean, so ECC is going to be broken, um, broken much before hashing. In fact, hashing, if you do it um, with a large enough hash, isn't going to be broken really. It'll have decreased strength, but it'll still be quite, a, quite sufficient for quite a long time to come. But say if ECC goes, are there good zero knowledge proof algorithms that are currently known about that don't use ECC? Uh, yes. Well, there there are actually uh, several uh, zero knowledge proofs that don't use ECC, but that are still broken by quantum computers. But there is actually one class of zero knowledge proofs that is that is uh, believed to be post quantum secure, um, oh. and that is. Uh, the, the family of zero knowledge proofs based on something called FRI. Uh, people may have heard have of mm. Starkware, the company uh, that is uh, um, developing some of these things in, in production. Although now many different businesses, in the, at least in the blockchain space, are, are also developing 
um, zero knowledge proof libraries that are based on this post quantum version of zero knowledge. And um, it has some drawbacks, mainly in the size of the proofs that are being produced. Uh, but otherwise, in terms of the time to compute proofs and the time to verify proofs, um, it's not as fast as the fastest, you know, ECC-based zero-knowledge proofs, but it is um, post-quantum, and it is uh, basically as fast as, as any other zero-knowledge proof that doesn't require trusted setup. So that's, an that's another whole thing that we didn't really get into, which is that some zero-knowledge proof systems require um, a trusted setup, which is uh, either performed by one uh, trusted party in particular or a committee of trusted parties to establish some public parameters that are used in the system. And if information that's used during the process of generating those parameters leaks, the integrity of the whole system is broken. So the fastest zero knowledge proofs um, require that, mm -hmm. but the, the post-quantum ones um, and several others that are not post-quantum uh, don't. Mm -hmm. And what's interesting is that the performance gap between the post-quantum proofs and the no trusted setup proofs is a lot smaller than the performance gap between, you know, the post-quantum zero knowledge proofs and the trusted setup fastest zero knowledge proofs. Mm -hmm. It's also something that we're, we see maturing at like unprecedented rates. Uh, so many people are interested in working on zero knowledge proofs these days, uh, especially because of interest from the blockchain community, which, um, has just accelerated a lot of research in that area. And, um, you know, new papers are coming out at a really fast clip. And so um, I imagine that the p we'll have pretty efficient post-quantum proofs pretty soon. Okay. We already have them pretty efficient, but it's, efficiency is a relative term. So it all depends on the real needs um, of the use case. Well, in fact, that's one thing that I um, was just discussing with one of the other cryptographers at consensus earlier today was about um, at the moment, if you've got a small number of gates in your zero knowledge proof, you know, it'll take a certain amount of time. And if you've got a lot more gates, it'll take more time. And um, do you think there will be a way of getting that sublinear? So as you have more, so um, just for the audience's sake, the more gates you have, the more, I don't know, um, code you have essentially. And so do you think there's going to be a way of having that sublinear um, so that, you know, you can have a large amount of code essentially that's being proven? Yeah, hold on. Let's, let's just explain that um, a little bit more for the audience. So um, actually the best way to, to explain it is that it's the running time of the computation. If you have a computation that's very expensive and you want to prove in uh, as give a zero knowledge proof that doesn't leak any information about uh, what happened in the computation, but only that the computation was correct. If the, the running time of the computation is really, really large, then um, that's uh, proportional to having the so-called many gates. Um, mm -hmm. And, but the, the, the size of the code actually can be very small and mm -hmm. the running time can be very large. It's just that when we describe computations in terms of um, circuits, which is a, not the computational model that programmers use, then there is no difference between the running time and the number of gates. You've basically written out all the steps um, mm -hmm. of the computation. Um, whereas code, you can have a very small piece of code that runs in a loop for a very long time. Um, and so, uh, yeah, so now, to, so to go to your question, you're asking about whether we can have, uh, are you asking how fast things are now for small? No, know, no, sure, no, sure. I'm saying, um, do yeah. you think the algorithms will develop so that um, that we'll be able to, you know, like reduce or crunch down the amount of time to process them so that they're, rather than it being linear with the number of circuits, it could be less than that, Oops, sub, you know, mm. sublinear. So fundamentally speaking, the proving time has to be linear in the computation. like. Intuitively, you can't prove that you've done a computation correctly unless you've actually done the computation. So the proving time can't be less expensive than the time to, to do the computation itself. But mm -hmm. what we can see reducing is the, is the overhead. So how much more expensive is it to prove that you've done the computation correctly than to do the computation itself? Mm -hmm. yep. uh, and that's, that's a gap that we can see kind of shrinking. Um, 
uh, not just in terms of the time, uh, but also in terms of memory consumption as well. It turns out that zero knowledge proofs consume a lot of memory. And there's actually some recent works that um, have uh, uh, given uh, new constructions of interactive zero knowledge proofs, which mm -hmm. don't use much more memory than doing the computation itself. Um, but they have to be interactive. So it would be really nice to see the same thing happen for um, for, for non-interactive zero-knowledge proofs, which are uh, what, what are usually desired for most uh, business applications. Th there are theoretical constructions that use very little memory, but then also have a high computational time overhead. Um, mm -hmm. So that's not clear that that's really a win. So for, anyways, to summarize, fundamentally, it needs to be linear, but the question is how much more expensive is completing a zero knowledge proof over doing the, the computation itself. Yeah. So I know that we've got some questions have flowed through and I just um, gonna, there, I know there was a question that was in the chat from uh, someone called Matt and I knew the answer, but I thought you, you I'll fire it at you. Um, so um, how close- oh, wait, Peter, sorry, before we go to that, I just wanted yeah. to clarify one thing. Yeah, sure. So, because you asked about the proving time. So one of the really important things about zero knowledge proofs is we have zero knowledge proofs that have a very, very small verification time. In fact, the verification time is tiny. It's constant, no matter the size of the computation. Yeah. So in case there was any confusion, um, you know, zero, one of the amazing things about zero knowledge proofs is that we can, um, and this is this is this also applies to verifiable computation. Doesn't need to be zero knowledge. We can ver we can prove that a computation was done correctly, and somebody can verify that uh, really really quickly um, mm. in less time than it took to do the original computation. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. That, thanks for that clarification. So now let's jump to the question. Yeah, let's jump to the questions. And a lot of these are from, you know, not necessarily directly on business. And um, yeah. so um, it's not, but unfortunately they're not, what's your favorite color, but. Um, so, <laughs> um, so, but, so how close are we to solving double spending on privacy and privacy on permissionless blockchains with zero knowledge proofs? And I thought Zcash had already solved this. I thought Zcash, you can't double spend, so you're all good. So I thought... Maybe the keyword was permissioned because Zcash isn't no, permission. No, this but was the, permissionless. Oh, permissionless. Well, in either permissionless or permissioned, uh, whether the whether the, the the system is permissioned or permissionless is, is uh, orthogonal, um, yes, that's exactly correct, Peter. Uh, we've already solved that problem because you could express the no double spending rule as a as a rule that applies to state transitions in in this uh, shared database of information um a database of financial transactions being one example and so yes as a very special case of what zero knowledge proofs solve they solve uh they solve the no double spending problem in a pr in a private setting yeah okay so um sebastian la duca hopefully i've pronounced your name okay um he's got a great question it's um and it's essentially the um, if then else question. So if you've got some code that goes, if this condition, then do this. So how would zero knowledge proofs deal with branches? Is there a multiplex light like gate? So at the moment, can um, the current systems handle branching in code or does it all have to be linear processing? That's a really nice question. So, um... So currently, uh, most constructions of zero knowledge proofs, uh, you know, uh, there is, I think that the way to, to think, to, 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 to rephrase the question is that if, you're, if your code has conditionals and if branches, et cetera, and the running time of the code is not the, is not, is, is not the same as the size of like the total possible number of paths the computation can take, um, then can the the proving or verif or you know verification time be proportional only to um, you know the fastest path of the computation uh, rather than uh, you know how the computation can be uh, basically completely flattened out and, and spelled out in a circuit and so there is uh, so the answer is most constructions uh, do not take any advantage of uh, of programs that have 
you know, uh, fast, um, uh, shortest paths of S or longest paths of executions. They have to spell out the whole circuit. Um, but there are a uh, particular uh, zero knowledge proof protocols that do take advantage of this um, in the interactive setting. So there's this nice paper um, by Vlad Kolesnikov and his student Dave David Heath that exactly took advantage of that, where uh, the complexity is proportional to like the longest execution path uh, rather than the total size complexity of the computation. Mm -hmm. Oh, yep, that's that's good. Thank you. Um, okay, over into the Q and A. Do zero knowledge proofs play the same role as proof of work plays on a blockchain? I.e., would it replace the need for proof of work in establishing consensus? Uh, so, no. So. Um, yeah. Yeah, so consensus and zero knowledge proofs are two independent uh, things. Um, and so zero knowledge proofs are, are, are used for, you know, proving that uh, state transitions in a blockchain are, are, are correct without revealing the contents of the state transition. But they don't, uh, they're not used to solve the problem of um, having many different parties come to agreement on an ordered list of transactions. Hmm. Now, um, maybe the question was going in a different direction and maybe I'll read into the question too much, but interestingly, there is work on building a proof of work from uh, expensive zero knowledge proofs, okay? So hmm. uh, people have looked at using um, snarks, which are, so, there's one one thing that's important to note is that verifiable computation is the ability to prove that computations were done correctly. And then one special type of verifiable computation is a zero knowledge proof, right? Where you also hide the computation that was being done. Uh, and SNARKs are the technology that uh, enable verifiable computation where the verifier um, does uh, verif verifies things very quickly, um, much quicker than the work that the prover does to produce the proof. So because uh, producing proofs is very computationally expensive, um, people have done work on using these proofs as a proof of work within a system. And one of the nice applications of that is perhaps to get like a useful proof of work where somebody can be producing proofs of uh, like uh, proofs of correct computation for some other re for some other application, maybe to scale the blockchain. And those proofs can be repurposed um, for you know, use within a Nakamoto-style uh, proof-of-work consensus protocol, so it fits into this realm of how can we build um, you know permissionless consensus um, based on some form of proof-of-work where the work that's being done is useful. Hmm. And I guess it's got the great property of asymmetric CPU loading, where it takes a long time to create, but a very short amount of time to verify. Um, so it's one of that, that class of algorithm. Yeah, any type of uh, computation that would be suitable for proof of work needs to have that property. Yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, okay, we've done that one. What about blockchains make zero knowledge proofs more relevant than they were before? Hmm. And I, I think you could, uh, anyway, I, I can certainly for the the monetary thing. There's the Zcash, which that made it quite relevant back quite a while ago, just from trying to hide the, who's doing the money transfer. But um, now it's you know I think things have moved along a lot from there. Anyway, over to you, Ben. What are you thinking? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, zero knowledge proofs are a way of um, of making uh, of making blockchains private, right? Uh, blockchains are, are um, uh, blockchains are a system where you're just um, enforcing consistent information among viewers and enforcing certain rules and that can be done completely privately using zero knowledge proofs and so it unlocks the potential to use blockchains for many use cases where um, where, where where privacy would have been um, a blocker so there are many business use cases that simply won't work on uh, a blockchain that's not private uh, because of privacy issues and so zero knowledge proofs are this really um, elegant solution that takes any application you would want to do um, on a blockchain 
and gives you the ability to do it privately. Hmm. Yeah. Um, okay. There are some. There are some caveats to that, of course. Like there are some uh, use cases where inherently what you want from the blockchain is to like force information to be public and distributed and shared among all participants. Yep. And so, of course, like that inherently is not a private use case. So, um, or yeah. rather that use case, uh, it, privacy wouldn't really make sense for that use case, right? But for any yeah. of the many plethora of use cases where privacy makes sense, zero knowledge proofs um, make blockchains all that more relevant by enabling it to work. Yeah. That, that makes sense. And I mean, it's it's like, you know, you don't say, I've got a hammer, every problem, every <laughs> problem, there is a nail. Right. Yeah. Got to use the appropriate tool and the appropriate technology for the problem. So um, someone asked, um, must have been quite early, much earlier on in the talks, what is a commitment to a, what does a commitment to a transaction mean? So what do, what do we mean when we say a commitment in this context? Yeah, so uh, the maybe people are f familiar with um, with hashes, but um, a commitment, uh, abstractly speaking, is a way of sending a small piece, sending a piece of information that um, is. It could be there's there's different types of commitments. So there's commitments where the purpose is to send something that's very small relative to the to the information that I hold, and then later reveal all the information. Um, and the, the property, the security property of the commitment is that if I, if I sent you the commitment, then there's only one piece of information that I can reveal to you later that's consistent with that commitment. And so the, the thing that we use for that is called a hash function. Um, mm -hmm. And that's like uh, probably the most widely known type of commitment. A hash function is a commitment. It's like a fingerprint, small fingerprints to a larger piece of data. Then there's yeah. also hiding commitments where I give you a piece of information that um, it, it may be small, it may not be small, it can be small, but the important thing is it hides the data that I've committed to. And only later would I reveal to you this data, and until then you have no clue, no information at all, what that data is. Now what's mm -hmm. really, really powerful is when you mix commitments with zero knowledge proofs, because that mm -hmm. gives you a scenario where you never actually have to reveal the information you can just prove information about it. So if I give you a commitment to my data and over time I prove different statements about the data, I never actually have to reveal to you the data. I just prove that if I were to open this data and you were to examine it, it would have this property. And I can we can continue to do that over time and you'll know that I'm always proving uh, statements about the same piece of data because you hold that commitment. I can't change the data I'm proving things about because it's committed to by this um, this commitment, like a small hash value that you're holding. Okay, and so yeah, so I I publish the hash value exactly, and then and then um, they say, well, how old are you? And then I say, well, he, you know, yeah. here it is, right. and you know, over, you know, and I released all I've released all this information, right. uh, but I'll only give it to you when needed, and then I yeah, right. okay, that's right. Yeah, yeah. You could you I mean, if if people ask if you if you publish a hash of your you know uh, of your passport and then slowly people ask you for different fields eventually you'll leak the whole passport but there are there are uh, meaningful examples where you have like a a, a large data set or you know um, the books of accounts of your business and you and you prove that certain audits are satisfied. Um, Eli talked about audits in his uh, in his introduction to zero knowledge proofs. So you could prove that you're passing the audits um, without actually giving the raw, like giving the actual information in your books. You can prove that you're solvent. You can prove that you know certain patterns don't exist. You could prove that all your transactions are on a certain permission list of um, destinations, etc. Yeah. Okay. So we've only got one more minute before we're going to have that. Um, the discussion session. Um, so we've, I can see that we've got a whole stack of questions here. And one of them, I'm going to ask you the one about, so there, there's a question about how long does a zero knowledge proof process take per proof, how many minutes? And I think it's per seconds or, you know, millisecond seconds or possibly minutes. And it depends on the algorithm and what you're doing. 
And so Zcash, for instance, takes milliseconds, I believe, um, to create. So we're not going to talk about that. And I encourage people to go and check that out for themselves because I think the answer depends on what you're doing. But the next one is one that you can definitely answer, and that is what zero knowledge um, proof or project are you most excited about? That's actually a really hard question. Um, I mean, I think that there's many different projects out there, both across academia and industry, and I think it would be impossible for me to uh, actually choose a favorite. Um, I think that there are many projects that are doing fascinating things. You have like uh, the coder protocol, which is, you know, using uh, proofs, not necessarily zero knowledge proofs, but they have a constant size blockchain. Uh, now it's called Mina. You have Aztec, which is using, um, and Matter Labs, which are using zero knowledge proofs um, in, in order to, um, you know, uh, uh, summarize some transactions that happened off the Ethereum network and, and have an Ethereum contract verify a large batch of transactions without knowing what those transactions were. Uh, it's called VK Rollup, and there's many different examples of companies doing that. Um, you have what Starkware is doing with building a, like a decentralized exchange, which also is doing something similar, um, where the Ethereum mainnet can actually verify what's happening. Um, there's a number of projects, uh, you know, uh, then exploring, you know, different uh, business use cases. I, I think it's really, really hard to pick a favorite, uh, a favorite project in industry. And in, in academia, it's the same. I mean, um, there's many different re interesting research questions that we're exploring now and how to make zero knowledge proofs more practical, how to, um, you know, extend their functionality to do different types of things. How can you do recursive proofs? Like um, imagine you wanted to always keep an up-to-date, uh, this is similar to what the Coda protocol is doing. Uh, you always want to keep an up-to-date proof of um, everything that's happened in the history of your blockchain um, or uh, the history, it doesn't have to be a blockchain. It can be um, a database. People are uh, using the same techniques for verifiable public key registries where clients want to make sure that their key isn't being changed. Uh, say for signal, you don't want to, you want to make sure that your, your signal public key is not being changed by the server, uh, then you can use, uh, well, not necessarily zero knowledge proofs, but proofs for that. And, and so there's just many different types of interesting work being done across proof systems, zero knowledge proofs, as well as applications in industry. Thank you. And so, um, Cameron, are you there? Yes, he is. Yes. And uh, yeah, Peter and Ben, thank you so, so much. It's been great. And Peter, real quick shout out. I love your shirt. It's very ah, cool. Yeah, <laughs> yeah the, the Pegasus t-shirt. Yes, very cool. And um, yeah, Ben and Peter, where can uh, the audience learn more about you and sort of what you're working on these days? Um, I um, have just posted, so I did a meetup talk at the Ethereum Engineering Group meetup just yesterday. And um, that was on the general purpose atomic cross-chain transaction protocol. And so if people have a look at that YouTube channel, um, they can watch the video of that and get the slides. And so that's on the GPACT protocol. Um, and the stuff on Filecoin is currently, we've got public repos, but it's Let's wait another three months or so until we've gone a bit further before you start looking at the repos. Ben, over to you. So the question was, where can people uh, learn more about me? Yeah, learn about uh, you or what you're working on. Yeah, I, so I, I try to keep the information up to date on my website. So if you uh, go to my Google Sites page, um, Ben-A-Fish, um, or just type Ben A. Fish into Google, then you'll find my Google Sites page. And that contains information on what I'm up to, what projects I've been working on, if they're public, and um, what papers I'm writing, et cetera. Uh, and it has my contact information there too. Awesome. Cool. Well, thanks again, you two. It's been a huge pleasure and an honor. Um, we do this every week. This is the Blockchain Acceleration Foundation. Uh, we're a 501c3 nonprofit that starts accredited blockchain courses. We get people jobs in this space. So, and Ben is actually our newest advisor of Bath. So that's very exciting. And um, I just dropped our link in the chat here. Feel free to become a member to get access to our Discord and recruiting programs. And um, yeah, we'll see you in the networking portion. Thanks again, Ben and Peter. And thank EA you for Simon. putting in.
Yeah. Thanks, Peter. See everybody. Great